All right, good afternoon, everybody. We'll get started, make sure everybody gets to the, everything on time today. They're, my name's Chris Kaler. I'm the director of new product development at Wakefield Vet, and CoolCentric is one of our brands that we sell through. Today, we're gonna to talk about the use of passive rear door heat exchangers and combined with free direct evaporative cooling in order to reach as low a PUE as we can, optimize for lowest PUE trying to reach under 1.1 uh, for a full three, tier three data center. Please interrupt me at any time during the talk for any questions. I'm uh, happy to entertain them. I've even got some technical backup with me here today to, to help with anything that goes over my head as the director. <laughs> so we're gonna go through some things here first. The rear door heat exchangers themselves. What is a rear door heat exchanger? How do they work? How do they provide uh, the cooling benefits that they do? How they are then combined with free cooling, and how does that affect the PUE that we would see in an uh, overall data center? We're gonna go into a case study that we've been involved in with Bangalore, in, in Bangalore, India with Infosys, an installation there in one of their tier three data centers. I wanna make sure I give a call, uh, a credit to the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, who's been a, a collaborator on this, as well as uh, Infosys themselves, the, the been able to work closely with them and being a half a world apart, that's sometimes not that easy, but it's been a very good collaboration in terms of trying to find out what, what's working well, what's not working well. I just wanna make sure I mention those guys here. So once we have a case study, we wanna say, well, what PUE did you actually uh, get to? How do, where we are now and where we're going? I will say at this point that it was a three phase rollout of the data center. We expected by the time we were here to give this talk that it was going to be fully installed. And as you can imagine, uh, things went longer than expected. So we're right now finishing up phase two. There's still another phase of install to go, and it's the biggest one. So it's kind of a snapshot in time at this point. So we'll see how, how things have gone well, how they haven't gone well, and we'll be able to have a good discussion about that. But we're not gonna be able to give you the fully finished uh, performance right now based on the fact that we haven't had a fully installed uh, data center. We'll look at some very important parts of getting the, getting the performance that we need, airflow and the installation. And that, when I say installation, it's not just of the doors themselves, but how you install the servers in the rack, how that has a big role, in, and, and you'll find out why as we talk about uh, how the rear door heat exchangers work. And I'd like to spend just a little bit of time at the end talking about potential for future uses as well as alternative uses of these kinds of technologies and how they can be used for optimizing based on whatever your specific data center needs are. All right, so we'll start off at, at a baseline. Obviously, this is very well understood by most everyone here in the room. When you have like a legacy air-cooled data center, what you try to do, well, you're always fighting are hot spots. Um, you have the need for these perforated tiles because you have raised floors. Um, but the thing that we'd like to talk about is that the density issues, right? So what we normally look at is density is under six kilowatt per rack. You have to build out all that infrastructure from day one. You have to know that's the, what you're gonna build. So you build in the raised floors. It's very hard to go back in and retrofit. It's possible, but it's more difficult. Uh, it consumes a lot of power. OPEX, OPEX is high because of the uh, inefficiencies based on using the crack units. That sometimes can be 25 to 35% losses just based on some of the issues that we've seen. It could be hot air mixing with cold air. It could be stratification on the front of the rack and, and containment of the air. We talked about the raised flows and the cost limits air flow out of tiles, but really I think what we internally what we talk a lot about is chaos cooling. So you have hot spots in one area, meat freezers in the other. A lot of it depending on the efficiencies of your HVAC system in general could be the way you're loading the racks and the loads around the data center. But in general, it's much harder to deal with very specific loads because it's a, it's a room-wide system that's looking at uh, mixing, that has a lot of inefficiencies in mixing the air. So how can we combat, what, what, what's some ways we can combat that to make a better system is what we're gonna talk about today. But before we get too deep into it, I wanna define the rear door heat exchanger for everyone that may not be familiar with it. So in this case, rear door, it's, it's, there, there's no trick in that. It has actually the, replaces the rear door of the rack itself. So instead of having just a normal perforated sheet metal door, this hangs in its place. So now when uh, air uh, moves through the rack from the front to the back typically, the air has to pass through the rear door heat exchanger. And when you say, now the second part of that is the heat exchanger part. As you can see in the door itself is a large tube and fin heat exchanger. 
So water flows through the larger tube system and it weaves its way in and out amongst the different parts of the door. And then you have these longer aluminum fins that are kept, you know, doing the heat exchange with the air as it comes through. So the heat from the air is transferred into the cooling liquid at the rack level at the rear door, and that's then shuttled away by the water flow in and out of the door. The good, obviously, one thing I want to mention before I go on, though, is that obviously you want to make sure that you're not that the temperature is below the dew point. So what, it's going to help us in this case to have actually very small approach temperatures, approach temperature being the temperature of the water versus the temperature of the incoming air into the server. So like in this case, we have a 78 degree Fahrenheit. You'd want to make sure that the water temperature coming into this rear door is as close to that as possible so you don't have uh, as much of a chance of condensation. And of course, humidity plays a role, and we'll talk a lot about that during the course of the slides here. The door itself is uh, used with quick uh, connections, so very reliable, uh, very low probability of leaks, and can be used with a lot of other similar things that are known within the liquid cooling infrastructure. So the, the trick here is that when, uh, when the equipment uh, exhausts its air in the actual servers, it, before it even re-enters the room and leaves the rack, it's been cooled down to the same temperature that it came into the rack. So the, that would be the way that if you could optimize all the knobs, that would be how you'd want to operate it. So that if you have any air mixing on the outside of the rack, you don't have to worry about hot aisle, cold aisle. Everything is just the ambient of the data center is being maintained at a certain temperature. The air never gets, uh, leaves the rack without being cooled down to near that ambient temperature. All right, heat is removed from the room through the water connection. It's almost like, in some ways, uh, we talked about crack units, you know, air, uh, air handling units that actually have compressors and refrigerants. We all understand, too, there's the crawl units that are air handling units that use water. This is like having almost like a miniature crawl unit on the back of your rack. So you're using water to exchange heat with the air and remove it before it enters into the room again. But the key parameters here, so there are obviously there's not just one size fits all. The heat exchanger in here can be uh, designed with different coil densities. It can be with different back pressures in mind. As you can imagine, you're pushing air through heat exchangers, so there will be a little bit of a back pressure for that air to move through it. And so that can be tuned in with the, with the uh, heat exchanger itself and the pressure drop of the liquid itself going through the, t the tubing, uh, velocity and the flow of the air. But the thing that I want to make sure we point out here is that we have the passive side of this. What makes it passive? Passive is that we're using the servers themselves to contribute the airflow that goes through the rear door heat exchanger. The fans of the servers are pushing the air. So we're not adding additional fan power on the rear door to help pull air through the heat exchanger. So that's a benefit in some ways for PUE, which we'll try to talk about today, but obviously it puts more of an onus on control and optimization of the server fans and working with them in a way that doesn't send the system into like a, a, a bad cycle, like you know the fans are turning up, but it's not getting the right pressure through and the heat's building up. So it all has to be thought about ahead of time, especially if you're gonna use them in a passive mode. So if you're doing it right, your goal would be that you would keep the delta T to near zero. You want the exiting air to be come back out into the room at the same temperature it came into the rack so that the data center is being kept at a certain ambient. Sorry, I misspoke. Oh. The air entering the, the rear door, not the... Oh, rack. well, yeah. So the question was, in case you didn't hear it in the back, was what's the delta T between the air coming into the rack versus that leaving the servers and going into the rear door heat exchanger, right? You want to know how hot the temperature would be before it goes in. How effective the rear door is in dropping the temperature. Oh, well, I have a slide on that in a second. But what I'll say is, of course, a lot of it depends on the coil uh, configuration itself. So there are, they're defined to handle a certain number of kilowatts based on a certain number of GPM that you're putting through the system. So they can, depending on the load and the coil configuration, that delta T can be different. So I'm just saying it's one of those, that's the, one of the optimization things that you would work with us per se or someone else who's making those kinds of rear door heat exchangers to figure out, okay, this is the load I anticipate for the rack and this is how much uh, heat I need to dump before the air goes back out into the room. So this is the slide, so good, it's the next one. I forgot which, where it was, but so you can see here's an example of uh, 
a, a rack with the, this is the rear door is basically out off. It's not on at all. There's no rear door there. Just showing the exit temperature. In this case, the delta T of about 10 degrees C. And I will apologize. I jump back and forth between Fahrenheit and Celsius like crazy, and it's annoying. And bear with me, and we'll do the best we can. But uh, it, it'll confuse me at some point, so just apologize in advance. Um, but the room air here is kept about 23 degrees C. It's exiting on the order of about 33 degrees C, more or less. And then the rear door is put on, and then now the air exiting out is back down to, in this case, probably slightly less than the room temperature. So we've overcooled the air just a bit as it left. So we, in this case, this door was configured. This was, as you can see, this is um, a 31 kilowatt cabinet. So we were able to take 31 kilowatts, remove all that heat from the air, uh, and then shoot out even, even a little bit more than that because we overcooled the air. That if you're smart and eagle-eyed, you'll see something though. You see some other red spots hanging out here too, right? So one of the things that we'll get into is where is where other paths can air go besides through the rear door heat exchanger. And that's really a key parameter for making these things work. So if you see other things, this could be just the surface of the rack. Of course, that's gonna be the air is in there. It could be recirculating around, heating up the actual sheet metal rack, and that's uh, also putting out heat into the room. So you may wanna overcool a little bit because you know you have heat leak in other places. That's all optimization that can be done. Is that, uh, okay, good. So how do these systems typically set up? Uh, as you can imagine, we would, would install these, uh, say, on a row of racks or uh, many rows of racks, and then you would have individual uh, hot and cold, or you know, input and output, uh, in and out water lines for each one. Like I said, they, each door would have its own, typically has its own input and output, and then they can be manifolded up to multiple doors on one manifold and then many manifolds, so there's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. But in general, you know, each one has their own uh, hot and cold. They can go straight out to some uh, chiller, return chiller, or dry cooler or cooling tower, or you could do go through a, a cooling uh, distribution unit. What's nice about the using the cooling distribution unit, and I don't really have too much skin in this game, I just was wanted to point out that it allows for some more control instead of having just brute force uh, water control temperature at some faraway source, you brought now to at least some certain number of racks or a certain number of rear doors, the ability to tune, and that'll also be a way to save energy because you can now tune the distribution of that liquid for the load that's being needed. So it's just another, another knob to be able to only put the cooling where you need it, when you need it, and that helps to lower the PUE as well. There's no, uh, Obviously, I just want to mention again, need to maintain the water temperature above dew point. Probably we've all been hit over the head with that so many times that we, we remember that. But the one thing I want to point out, too, is that this is a kind of a low pressure system. So the reason the water flowing through the tubes, it's bigger tubes. It's a larger copper tube diameter. So the low, it's low pressure, about 20 PSI to get flow through multiple racks. Of course, that's, we say about, because it's all going to be very specific on how many you're doing through certain manifolding and, and all, whatever valving you have on there. But, and also it's a low volume system, about a gallon per door total volume, and the flow rates are usually on the order of a few gallons per minute for most of our applications. So in general, you're, it's not a large volume system and it's not a high, it's a low, low volume and low pressure system. Of course, the chilled water source itself could be any that you would have on site. We're, we're, not, we're agnostic to the, where the water comes from. Could be city water, or building chilled water, or packaged chiller, or cooling tower. Of course, we're gonna speak more specifically about evaporative cooling towers in this case. Um, and we see that we can work with this, we, oh, sorry. We see that, uh, we say here a little thing about efficient cooling at 65 degree Fahrenheit supply of water. Even higher than that, right? We're, in this case, we're gonna be using even higher temperatures than that. So it really depends on what ambient air temperatures you're able to live with, the higher the better. We just heard earlier this uh, today uh, in the talk down the hall about 95 degree Fahrenheit air and how the systems could take it. We'd love to see that everywhere. We could really do a lot of cooling, a lot of free cooling in a lot of places with that, and we'll get into that in a little bit too. But so the warmer the better for efficiency, but of course we're not, we're agnostic to temperature too. Whatever you're running, obviously the, the heat exchangers will work under many different uh, water temperatures. Any questions about the rear door heat exchangers then and how they work and passive and how the how we're gonna set up for this? Okay. So obviously we, we, almost everyone here has heard PUE a million times. So we just wanna make sure that kind of our own credibility that we kind of 
uh, even though you probably will take shots at it, but we, what, how we're doing, of course, total data center, input power, IT load. Good news is that we, our partners are good about doing this. Like I say, Infosys and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, they are really good about holding everybody's feet to the fire in terms of uh, better maintain uh, a good standing about what's being included and what's not included. But that's the biggest thing is making sure that you're including as many things as you can. You're not trying to carve out big um, power users just because it's in inconvenient. Look at annualized averages versus a point in time snapshot. Um, and loading uh, and geographical location, of course, plays a big role, and we're gonna talk about that too, especially for free cooling. But we're trying to be really upfront and honest, so if, the, if you see anything that doesn't seem like that, it's not intentional. We wanna make sure that we have a real good understanding of what's going on, we're not painting a rosy picture for, you know, uh, when it's not really there. So this is a snapshot of the data center that we plan to uh, install with emphasis. And of course, we've built up a straw man here. And the straw man here, you could obviously take some shots at it. Maybe it's, we're overestimating some things, underestimating others. But it's based on emphasis, uh, it's their experience, right? So the, these numbers are not my numbers. They come from emphasis. And this how they sold it internally. Like if we do this project, this is what our savings are going to be over what they've already done in the past. So we tend to trust them to say this is what they've done in the past. Uh, they, their big goal here was to challenge some existing design practices. Again, go against the typical hot air, cold air, or hot aisle, cold aisle kind of architecture. Bring in liquid cooling in a way that was going to be efficient, maybe without having to do get the liquid too close to the actual components. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. So it's a, there's a good compromise there in using the rear door heat exchangers. And of course, there's some other parts of this that are not going to be talked about today. Uh, one thing you'll notice is there's a, well, the, the uh, power supplies, how there's a big drop in the power for them in this new case. And so that's, that's another part of what they've done to optimize the system that we're, we're not going to talk about today, but they've got, they, they have some parts of the project that aren't about the cooling and the rear door heat exchangers. So the, the goal is to have a tier three data center. We'll talk a little bit about the, the redundancy and the cooling part of that. Uh, just so you know, you know, again, totally open and honest about what's going on there with operating temp temperature of 27 degrees C. That means, a, you know, that's roughly a 80 degree Fahrenheit, unless I've got that wrong in my head again because I've done this too many times in my head to get, and I always get it wrong. But you're talking about 27 degrees. That's the ambient air in the data center. So we go back to that first slide where I talked about the air going into the rack versus exiting. That's the temperature that we're supposed to be holding in the data center, 27 degrees C. And then we think that we can get less than 1.1 in PUE by reducing this 90% of this infrastructure energy consumption. This, this typical PUE of 2.0, I think is, a, you know, those are, that's kind of an older number, right? Things are getting better, hopefully, in a lot of cases. But and again, that's how it was sold internally at Ipsos, is that many of their data centers, especially in these warmer parts of the world, were running very high PUEs, around two. And their goal was to try to get that down to close as one as possible. So again, I just want to point out that but the lion's share of the kilowatt hour savings is in this cooling aspect. So we're talking about an order of magnitude drop, and that's that 90%. So basically drop by 90% the amount of energy needed for cooling. And that's assuming a lot of free cooling. Yes, sir? Sorry, is that assume typical from the crack unit cooling on the left? Yes. That's my understanding. The question, if you didn't hear, was, was this, this number here, this uh, uh, three quarters of a million kilowatt hours, is that would normally be a crack unit? Yes, that's my understanding. So okay. it's straw man of the worst case scenario. Okay, so that's where you're measuring the energy. Is that the measure? Or are you measuring the kilowatt hours at the meter? Into the my understanding is the, the BMS, the building monitoring system, is doing it at the meter. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to get this. Sorry again for the small print on some of these graphs, but this chart is showing this. We'll just call it PUE for lack of argument. So this uh, uh, kilowatts over kilowatts, but it's a, basically a PUE measurement. And across the bottom are different snapshots of server inlet temperatures, air t air temperatures, and chilled water temperatures. So these aren't exactly meant to show what we're doing in this case. It's meant as a uh, this, this was taken uh, from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. As I said, they've been a, a good uh, resource for us. And what it's showing is that what is the different um, potential PUE numbers that you can get with different kinds of cooling technologies. So you'll see at the very bottom here in the purple is a direct touch cooling. 
and it's already good to start with, but of course, as you, and just so you know too, as you go uh, from left to right on this x-axis, the temperatures of the air and the temperatures of the waters are all going up. Sometimes they stay the same from point to point, but in general, there's an increase in temperatures as you go from left to right. The purple shows if you were to direct touch cooling, meaning if you were to have specific hardware going into the servers themselves, bringing liquid cooling to the chips, to the memory inside the actual server box is kind of what we all see uh, at every exhibition we go to and starting to be implemented in some cases. That's where you can get, that's bringing that water, bringing the liquid that close to the components gives you the best efficient of the cooling. But if right next to that is this rear door heat exchanger when they're passive. So it allows, especially as the temperatures start to go up, you get even more efficiencies uh, because you can get more free cooling, and we'll get into that. So as higher ambience, higher water temperatures, you get more ability to take free cooling into account. Right above them are things like in-row cooling, rack coolers, and then you have the craw and the cracks at the, very, at the very worst up there, okay? Of course, what's really important about all this is can you, can you find the ability, the operating temperatures to get that 99% of the year cooling, uh, uh, evaporative free cooling, and only need that chilled water plant 1% of the year? And also, can you get a BMS, a building management system, integrated so that it really is uh, finding the right optimized flows and moving, moving, the, moving parts around to the data center in terms of liquid, uh, turning the chillers on when it needs to, to really maximize efficiency. All right, any questions about that? Okay, so here's another chart that's impossible to read, so I apologize, but this is, there's a bunch of cities on here, they're all US cities, and what you'll see here is, uh, these are temperatures, just uh, wet, wet bulb temperature, but what would be, if you could use wet bulb temperatures of this, uh, 65 degrees, 75 degrees, and that's Fahrenheit of, of water, how much free cooling can you m muster approximately every year um, if, you had the, if you could use those temperatures? And what you'll see is that obviously the less humid areas are better. It's evaporative cooling, so yes, low humidity helps you to evaporate and cool things better. So less humid areas, even if they're hot, can actually be pretty useful for free cooling. An example is uh, many places that you wouldn't think, like say Phoenix, where we are right now, and even Las Vegas, when you have water temperatures that are high enough, you can still get 98, 99% of the time evaporative cooling because they're very dry, right? And then in general, even a place like New York, where the humidity is high, but the temperature is lower, you can still get you know, 99%. Thankfully for us, Bangalore, has high temperatures in between Las Vegas and Phoenix in terms of high temperatures, but it's about as wet as New York. So it's a kind of a little bit of a worse of both worlds, right? So it's a good place to try this out where it's, it is warm, there is a lot of humidity, but by our calculations, we can still manage to get a lot of free cooling in this, in, even in this area. Okay, so I'm gonna hit some, high level things here and then we'll kind of re get back to them and make sure, you know, I'm just trying to make sure there's at least two or three things that you leave here remembering about rear door heat exchangers and how they can help. The server fans provide the airflow, that's because they're passive. The higher the ambient air temps and the higher the chilled water temps that you can use, the, you can still get the same approach temperature you would say that if you use lower temperatures and still get all that heat out and you can use evaporative cooling to get lower PUE. So that's really what we're trying to set out to do, show higher data center ambience along with higher chilled water temperatures, maintaining the same approach temperature, the delta T between them, get all the heat out with better PUE. So how do we do it specifically? Let's get into some of the details on what we did in, in Bangalore. So we have the data center that's, like I said, being maintained at 27 degrees Celsius. Hey, I got it right, 80, 80 Fahrenheit. Um, then you'll have the cooling towers out here. Those are ev evaporative cooling towers and those, those will feed it most of the time, we hope 99% of the time with this cooling system, uh, cooling uh, temperature about 24 degrees C, so 75 F. And I know it's probably too hard to read down there, but the, the, uh, we do have, just to show you that we have the redundancy built in for the tier three design intent of the data center. We have the cooling towers, which have 30 tons, there's four of them, so it's about 120 tons capacity. 
There's the water cool chiller that is kind of on standby. That's, the, that's really the kind of the standby mode to get the most performance when you need it. There's only one of those, but it's huge, you know, a 200 ton unit. And then we have these air cooled chillers that are down here. They also act as a secondary or a tertiary form of cooling. And there are four of them at also at 30 tons each. So the uh, three, three tiers of cooling possibilities in the data center. So the, the, the target of three degree approach temperature is really kind of where the rubber hits the mode, rubber hits the road, because can we really get all the heat out of the servers with only a three degree delta T between the ambient air and the liquid in the rear door heat exchangers? That's really kind of where we're gonna find out how good we are and, all, and we'll get into that. Keys to success that we kind of went into telling them in terms of how to install, of course, is blanking panels to stop leaky air. We talked about where, can, where else air can go besides through the heat exchanger. If it doesn't go through the heat exchanger, it doesn't get cooled down, so we don't like that. So we will tell them blank off as much as you can. Like I said uh, in the talk earlier today, the guy talked about all the little nooks and crannies that he found in his lab ended up being like a 100 square foot hole, you know, equivalent to a 100 square foot hole in the bottom of the data center. Yeah. So in the, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit, but the, the question was what are the kilowatts per rack? They're designed for 10 kilowatts a rack at, at this stage, at this phase of the installation. Uh, Mark, do you know if there's any, if that's different for the third phase? Uh, it's supposed to go up to 25 to 30 on Yeah, I knew the final one, I think was supposed to be close to 30 kilowatts, but per rack. Uh-huh. All right, and then, so we also told them like, we really need to make sure the heat is evenly distributed. As you can imagine, because the rear door heat exchanger takes up the whole rear door, if you only pass the hot air through a portion of it, then you're only using a portion of the heat exchanger. So making sure that you uh, install the servers in a certain way to make sure that you take advantage of the full frontal area of the heat exchanger is really important. Then of course the building monitoring system is also important. It, number one, it tells us what's going on. And a lot of times we don't know that in a lot of installations. And then number two, it allows you to, to meter out whether it be the chilled water, the, it really gives you an idea of what PUE is going on. So here's the, again, I wanna make sure I give credit. This is the, the building monitoring system was by Automated Logic. This just shows you a lot of the racks. You can see here, like in blue, it's hard to read, but you know, you'll see 10 kilowatt, 10 kilowatt, 10 kilowatt. So that's the install, what's installed right now. Again, it's uh, early in the phase of installation, so there's gonna be more parts installed in there. And then you'll see it's reading incoming air temperature and outgoing air temperature. In this case, this was taken early on, and you'll see a lot of overcooling of the air. Most of the air leaving is cooler than it's coming in because we have a little bit more capacity. Also, you can see in the white what's actually being run. So, of course, in a, in a, in a rack where there's no power being drawn right now, it's easy to get overcooling of the air because there's no, there's no power in there. Okay. And this is another, again, just want to make sure, you know, just for the sake of the talk to make sure you guys see what we see. And uh, the, the panel for the PUE, it'll show you uh, the PUE. We can also do year to date, current quarter, previous quarter. So there's a lot of things we can do to get older data all uh, filtered through, you know, different times of day. And I'll go into a little bit of that too. And also see what's being used right now, how much power is being drawn, the utilization of it. You can see we're not very utilized, which is part of our issue that I'll go into in a second. All right. So... The PUL, so this is a little de deceiving, so I'll just make sure. So for phase one, the very first was a, a small number of racks populated with the, the 30 kilowatts and a small number of rear doors installed and PUE of 1.1 was found. But it was basically almost like a proof of concept of what was gonna be built out. So then they built out the regular phase two, which was many more racks, but they were not fully populated. So if I can make sure I get that. So PUE, phase one was a small number of racks, fully populated, phase two was a large number of racks, but not fully populated. So what we found was PUE was really good at first, when they had fully populated racks on a small scale. And then we went to phase two with the uh, majority of the capacity installed. It means the racks were there, but the PUA, PUE went up. So normally it was 1.25 to 1.34. And the, so we, we've, been, we've been saying average of PUE is 1.3, and that's been over a few months, right? So this is like, we're not, we don't have years of data. This is over a few months of the installation. So we expect the PUE to approach 1.1 at the end of phase three when we have the full capacity installed with actual servers. But 
for now, we'll, we can go into some more of the specifics on why it wasn't, it's a good learning experience for us, why the PUE went up so much, even when we have like over capacity, right? We have better, we have more capacity to cool than we do. And it's really, that's the problem. We were over cooling in a lot of cases, right? Any questions? As an example, just to show you, this is a snapshot of the month of January. Uh, and what you see on the bottom is the outside ambient temperatures going up every day. Here, of course, we had some sensor outage, so please disregard that. So you can see the hot, cold, hot, cold of the daily cycle. And then up here, you'll see the PUE. Uh, and it's not, you'll see this not tracking exactly the temperature changes outside. So what that tells us is it's not the ambient temperatures that are causing PUE to be high, it's something else, right? We have other problems with the installation, other reasons why we're using too much energy besides the fact that the evaporative cooling is not working or the rear door heat exchanger is not working. So I just want to make sure I, you know, we, we all uh, get to see that. So we're really not dependent on uh, and we really we went through very carefully on this. Like you'll see small peaks maybe, but you'll see big peaks here that correspond to nighttime, right? I mean, it's it's not there. There really is no correlation with the outside ambient to the PUE of the system. And we really should be more if in in the real world if we had this thing running as it should, then we should see it track the temperature because we would be 99% evaporative cooling, and we should really see it track with outside conditions much better. So that's a, a signal to us that that's not what's happening. So one of the issues that we found was, first off, there were a lot of air leaks. There were a lot of ways that the installation was done where there, there were not blanking panels used correctly. There were large parts of the rack that were left open, not only from a distributed load does that bad, but it's also, also bad from air recirculation. So you have a lot of air gets trapped in the rack and just keeps spinning and spinning around, getting hotter and hotter, right? And, uh, but the worst thing about that about this specific thing is when they built out phase two, since they only were gonna put 10 kilowatts in the rack, they put all 10 of them in the very top, right? So the, we were only using about the top quarter or a third of the rear door heat exchanger. It's, I mean, it's, okay. it's still, you know, it's cooling and the PUE is not, it's not like it's two, it's better than two. We're still doing, say, better than what they had wanted. But of course, when you promise 1.1, you better get close to 1.1. And uh, that's one of the things that will be much better off when we get more of the racks uh, populated. So we're under, under utilizing the heat exchanger. Improvements in phase three should help to lower the PUE. Yeah. So are you doing improvements to phase two during phase three? Yeah, so it's getting messy. You can imagine. So we got, uh, we have representatives of ourselves, emphasis, the installer, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, all going through the data center, and they're all saying, we need to fix this, you need to do that. So everybody's got their own favorite fix. And the biggest thing is, of course, in our minds at least, the biggest thing is the distribution in the racks and the air leaks. I mean, once we fix those two things, I think we'd be in much better shape. All right, I want to just do a little bit of the financial side of the rear door heat exchangers and using the free cooling. Again, this is a reproduction of that first uh, plot that you saw, or the first table in there, which showed the kilowatt hours. So all this data is the same thing I already showed earlier. And now we've added this new column that shows that savings. Again, just pointing out that the majority of the savings was from, uh, so 674,000 kilowatt hours out of the million, roughly million uh, kilowatt hours is from the cooling solution. There's quite a bit from that UPS system, again, that I said we're not gonna really talk about here. But, uh, so they, they've broken out the two savings those two big chunks of electrical savings, what is the ROI on those? So for the cooling system, which is our, where we care most, uh, if it's a $300,000 investment to, to get those rear door heat exchangers installed, they're estimating $100,000 a year in electrical power savings based on these kilowatt hours. And so the payback is our, uh, three years. So the ROI is reasonable. I mean, we'd all like it to be you know, a quarter. But of course, you know, in this case, uh, the lifetime of a data center, three years is not too bad. It's, it could be better, but it's not too bad. Any questions on that? All right, so I want to come back to, yeah, sorry, I'll just say I wish we could have more definitive information on the final thing. Too bad we just, we're not there yet with the phase three. Maybe we'll come back next year and we'll give you a better final, final uh, verdict on how it all worked out. But for now, I'm going to just turn to the, uh, to other potential products where this could be used, or at least you could say they're 
uh, tangential. So go back to this plot that I showed earlier, which is again, this basically PUE on the y-axis and these rising air and water temperatures along the x-axis. And we talked about the real order heat exchangers was about the best you could get compared to uh, direct touch cooling. But there's these other ones that are nearby, right? And so the optimization really depends on the data center specific needs, right? Some people might do really well with a specific, you know, with an individual rear door heat exchanger. Some might do better with uh, these other in-row coolers or rack coolers. Uh, and in, in general, any time that we can bring liquid as closer to the servers is the better. In which way, if it's a retrofit or new construction, everybody's gonna have their own flavor that they would rather see uh, be implemented. So we're, we're sensitive to that. So it may not be that the rear door is the best solution in all cases. So what else is there that we can do? Because there's a lot of potential overlap in performance uh, right in this area, right? So you're, you're talking about PUE differences here on the order of about point, uh, you know, point 0.1. Right, so that's that's really small difference in there. So what what is it really going to work for you guys in your specific thing? So what we have done is look at how can we bring. It's like I say, it's like you took it from an ind, almost like having an individual uh, air handling unit, like a crawl right on the end of the server or on the rack, and then how can you scale that at different? What are the different scales that you can do that at that are interesting for people? So we have a what we call the row level cooling, uh, row level uh, crawl. These are typically custom solutions that are done at facility and at the facility level. Again, it can be retrofitted. Sometimes it's nice to have the ability to build it in a new construction, but we've done a little bit of both. And so the ability to either build them into the ceiling, which we think is a kind of a preferred way to bring the air. So you can imagine here, all these rows are facing out. This is the cool side. The air is coming in to this side of the, and then on the back side of this. And then when it exits out the back, this is of course all, this is all, uh, uh, sealed off, so the air is forced to come up through this big air handling unit with liquid flowing through here, just like a rear door heat exchanger, but now it's doing, you know, 40 racks instead of just one rack, right? And the same thing can be done at the end of the row, again, all sealed off, the, the air is coming in from this front and from the back, exits in the middle, and is then pushed out through these heat exchangers. So it's just a way, in some ways, and this can be scaled to a few racks, could be scaled to 40 racks. It's a, it's a nice way to scale what you're doing without having to worry about um, the individual rack consumption. So that's one of the things that we're seeing even at the emphasis installation. If you have, if you know you're having a lot of racks that you want to do this to, maybe it's better to take all that air and let it mix and do cooling at a, at a bigger scale because you may have one rack, and you may not be able, if you don't have the control to bring, to meter the water at the individual rack level, then you're always going to have some inefficiencies creep in. But if you can mix in, if you know that your average kilowatt hours or kilowatts from a set of racks, then you can more, more efficiently cool that air and maybe reach a better PUE in the end. The other thing is active doors. We talked this whole talk about pa passive doors and how great they are, and they are great, but sometimes you don't want a passive door. There are some times when you don't want to have to worry about the servers pushing the air through. You want to have one more knob, right? So if you want to have one more knob to uh, put in additional airflow, lower the stress on the server fans, in some ways this allows you to run, what we found is allows you to run at even higher ambient temperatures in the, in the data center because now you're not just worried about the fans running up at 100% all the time. You can augment the airflow through the rear door with fans. The second thing is, since we're augmenting the airflow through the rear door heat exchanger, you can also increase the capacity quite a lot. So you're going from, say, in our case, maybe maxing out at about 25 or 30 kilowatts for a passive door. Now you can go up to 50 or more kilowatts in a rack by having that extra airflow so you know, for the, what we've seen, the people who don't care about PUE, maybe people who do supercomputing sometimes, they don't as care about energy consumption as many as, other, as others do, they want performance. So they'll, they want to have that extra turbo switch to put on and really pull the air through the heat exchanger. Okay. So I think we're, yeah, we're doing really good on time. So I've gone fast. So three key things that we want to make sure you walk away from this session is that, I think it's actually four, so forgive me, but passive rear door heat exchangers can deliver lower PUE with free cooling. We've seen it in smaller like proof of concepts and these pilot runs. I mean, they've been around for a long time, so it's not like it's new, but people are really looking at them now as a 
tool to get to the low PUE before they've been a nice tool for people to add on, let's say, in a university data center where they really want to bring liquid cooling and, and, and they've kind of overstuffed a room. So it's a nice way to augment the crack units that they might already have. So in this case, though, if you build it from the start, it is a good tool to move towards lower PUE with free cooling. But the devil is in the details. The server load and the distribution in the rack, obviously we've seen makes a, a big difference. The airflow, the amount, you know, make sure you really understand the server components because they're the ones who are providing the airflow. So understanding their fan curves, understanding what you're putting in the rack uh, is just as important as how many kilowatts you're putting in there as how many CFM capability you're putting in there too. So that all plays a role. The sizing of the rear door heat exchanger is also key. What we see, as you can imagine, to save on CapEx, they want the smallest rear door that will do the job. But what we've seen is that the incremental cost of oversizing the capacity of the rear door really pays dividends. You don't pay that much more, say, for a rear door that can do 30 kilowatts versus 25. But having that extra margin of cooling capacity, we, they always need it. Every time, they always need it. Right? So we, we, we just uh, would put that out there is if you're going to give yourself margin, give it to you on the heat exchanger side because usually you don't get the airflow you want or the servers aren't loaded the way you want. There's always need for more margin. And you can still get really good PUEs even with a little bit extra capacity on the rear door heat exchanger. Um, free, pooling can, free cooling can work in more places than you think, even when there's higher ambience. Uh, outside, but what we're saying is the key to it is running higher ambience and higher water temperatures on the inside of your data center. I know that's something that everybody talks about. It's uh, obviously the way to reduce energy, but in this case, it's a, um, a nice way to do it at the same time using the rear door heat exchangers to, to really kind of ultra low PUE in our, in our mind. Getting to 1.1 or less, I think would be, a real, uh, would be a really good thing for all of us. And then, Work with suppliers to find the right solution for your data center. Like I said in those last things, we, we're happy, and most people are happy to do some of the engineering uh, legwork with you to find out what's the right solution. And there's a lot of different ways to bring liquid cooling into the data center, whether it be at the rack level, at the row level. So we're uh, more than happy to work with you guys to find out what the right solution is. It's not just, not everything's a nail. So we don't, hit, we're not a hammer, not everything's a nail. Everything is very specific. All right, I'll take any more questions, and if you have any more, if you want to just throw a card up here at the end, when we leave, I can send you some of these slides, and I think it'll be on the website, uh, also the audio and the video of the talk, so you'll be able to get access, I think, in the future. Yep. So very early on, you had a slide showing hot air exiting the top of the rack. Yeah. Well, I think what, how I meant to address that, the question was for anyone who didn't hear was that early slide that shows the red hot top of the rack, even with our heat exchanger, uh, rear door heat exchanger on there. And that's really because that's, an, that's a combination of an air leak and a combination of also just warmed up server rack, right? So what I would say is we address that by saying, look, really seal up the rack, use blanking panels, make sure the air, even even, that we do have some, I guess you would call them plenums, a way to kind of help air into the rear door exchanger. So there are all kinds of ways we can kind of force air away from the outside. We don't really, we don't really want the hot air to touch much of the outside rack. Uh, good news is they usually all just slam together anyway. So there's not, you know, if they're, they're, they're all getting heated up and we can, they, they kind of share the load. But in general, we want to keep all the air moving through the heat exchanger blinking panels, and do your best to keep the air away from the outside of the rack. Yes, sir. So since the passive relies 100% on the, on the server fan, can you talk about any minimum requirements that you would need to look for as far as the server fan performance and controls? Right. Um, and second part to that question, is there a point at which it was legacy gear or something where you have to go to an active door because, yeah. of, because of not being able to so the, the question was, is there certain specific server requirements, or at least we'll say fan requirements, that we look for to use the rear door heat exchangers in the passive mode, and then is there some tipping point where the active door makes more sense? So I know that we have a rule of thumb in general for how much CFM we need per kilowatt, uh, and it usually is kind of independent 
Uh, well, I shouldn't say it. It does, it does scale. You know, the, di the different doors have different densities of fins. So the pressure drop is changing. So, I mean, I'll defer. Mark, do you want to speak up and say what our rule of thumb is for the CFM? Yes. So for our, our standard density door, we usually use about 100 CFM per KW. For our higher density doors, we usually use like a, a high density. And our ultra density, we try to aim more towards about 120 to 150. It doesn't mean you can't run with more air. So um, on the standard density door, it's about 100 CFM per kW. For the higher densities, we say uh, 125 to 150. Uh, as a general rule, you can run with less, right? Um, what it could mean is that you're not able to achieve 100% of cooling, or you may end up in a situation where, um, and I've seen this on a couple of applications, um, Again, customers aren't always asking for 100%, but there may be other reasons why you don't want to have all that cooling, all that airflow going through the doors, right? Again, at 175 CFM per kW, that's an awful lot of airflow. Um, the air is going through the door so fast, it doesn't have any time to actually pick up the heat, right? So at that point, I almost wanna go for an extra, extra, extra density door to try and put in more surface area so that I can slow the airflow down that's a higher pressure drop, which probably means I'm putting too high of a load on the servers themselves. And that may speak to the second part of the question, which is where do you get to the tipping point for an active door? And I think it's that you're speaking to it there, right? At some point, you, you'd either build the passive door so thick, let's just say, let's say we're constrained in the door frame, so you have to go thicker to get more heat exchanger in there. At some point, you might as well put fans on it to help pull air through because you're getting too much of a pressure drop. So I think the pressure drop probably is the the capacity and the pressure drops the tipping point and how much CFM you're willing to put in the rack. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, and, and to your question, you asked about legacy equipment. I mean, um, we have a couple of customers who are using side-to-side -side cooling equipment in a traditional four-post rack with sides on it. It's not the most brilliant way of doing it, but that's what they've done. Um, you can try to use plenums to try and circulate the air. But realistically, the best way to do that one is an active door. Physically pull the air through because the server fans are exhausting basically into a wall. It's not the best use for the fans. Um, we also have customers who take equipment who it's not designed to be put in a four post rack and put it in a four post rack because it makes their data center look pretty. <laughs> um, I've been in a lot of data centers that have traditional desktop equipment sitting in a uh, you know, into a rack itself. It looks pretty, it looks nice and uniform, but that equipment is not designed to be in that rack, right? So that may be a situation where, again, you need an active door to pull the airflow through the system. And side-to-side -side things, Cisco's famous for that. They are. And uh, Panduit, well, can I say a better name? Uh, Panduit and ATC both have solutions for that. Mm -hmm. Correct. But you have to go and use up valuable space in your cabinet That's right. to redirect the air. And I know there are some other ways to use, I think we used to call them sidecars, that go on the side of the rack. But now you're taking up space in the data center where another rack could be. So it's, it's, you're, you give up something either this stays way. stays in, in the rack. Right. But it's, yeah, I've seen those too. I just want to hit the right the network right. That's how we feel all the time. Anything else? Yes. You were talking a little bit earlier about the pulse temperature. You know, that gives you max centigrade. Um, does that give pulse temperature from the wet bulb temperature outdoors all the way to the final level temperature? Do you ever see that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's. A good question. So if, if, if you didn't hear the question, the question was the approach temperature I mentioned earlier was a 3 degree C difference, 27 to 24 degree C. And where is that temperature being monitored? Where is, the, where is that being measured? Is it consistent all the way back out through the water chain out to the chiller unit? 
I have to say, my understanding is that's being, they're, so they're monitoring the temperature, especially if we go back, this is early on, so it's not gonna be a direct comparison. But if you look at the BMS data, sorry, as I go through all these again. Um, okay, so if you look here, there are a cold and warm water temperature monitoring points, and there's more than one, there's more than one of these pairs. This is a screenshot, the screen is four times that big, so it's many other parts of the, of the data center. There's other data center measurement points for the water temperatures. So it's not local, but it's at this building level where we're trying to measure the temperature, but it's not at the chiller unit, right? So what we're, what we're, the goal was to bring this temperature to within three degrees of the ambient temperature. Here, you're, it's running much lower, like 17 degrees C. So this is, this, but don't, that's not what, this was not under uh, the normal operation. Um, but in general, that's where it's being measured, is in the building, close by. I don't think it's changing much between where it's being measured and the racks themselves, but I can't really speak intelligently about how much it might be changing from that measurement point back out to the chillers. Yes? I don't know that I can answer that question. Mark, can you answer that? I just see, that's what I do. That's my job is to say, Mark, can you answer that question? So the, the doors are designed to operate between six gallons per minute and up to a max of 15, right? So, in, and obviously we're gonna, let's just say we're gonna go from six kW up to 35 kW, right, under that condition. So if you're gonna look at a traditional crack and craw unit, you're gonna be running a lot more water flow through those individual units, but you're also gonna be getting rid of a lot more heat that way, right? I'd have to go through, I'd have to pull a couple of examples to see if it's a direct one-to-one -one comparison and how it would actually line up at the end. I think what, what I will say is that when you have a centralized system like that, I think you have overcapacity, right? You built it in. so. Same thing could be said here, right? So you're flowing more water through there than you probably need to. So, but I'd say, comparatively speaking, if a kilowatt out of air goes into water, the chemistry, physics is pretty well understood, right? I mean, we know how much heat it can take. So from that point of view, you're taking heat and putting it into water, and then you're gonna go put that out somewhere in the, in the ambient in the world. So I would, I would say that it would at least be kind of an even, Stephen. I don't think we can go out there with a value proposition that says you're gonna use half the water if you use rear door heat exchangers. You still gotta get all that heat into the water and get it out in the world somehow. The other thing I would say is, you know, in, in this particular case, um, they do not have any flow restrictors on their manifold system. So each door is running at, I think it's 10 gallons, eight to 10 gallons per minute. If you had a server that was, say it's only doing minimal, you know, three or four kW, even six kW, you could put a circuit setter on there and dial that one down. Right? When you go to the rack that's got your HPC equipment, that's got 30 and 40 kW in it, right, and you dial that one up. You don't necessarily get that level of control with a crack or a craw, right? You're just, it's just water into the data center. Right? It's just overkill, and that's where you end up with the spot cooler. And I want it just to piggyback on that, the, not only the circuit setters, but if you're nuanced about the CDU, in conjunction with circuit setters and other valving techniques, then you can get real specific. And I think that's, that's what it takes, right? If you really wanna get PUE down as low as possible, it really takes like understanding the little nuances of each rack and then dialing them in, right? And that could be done, I think, a little easier with our system than it would be with a larger centralized system. Yeah? That's okay. We got six minutes. I like the way that she turned around and asked Mark. Yeah. <laughs> the, the question, in case you didn't understand, the question was, is there, are there ways of controlling the doors uh, uh, through wireless or ethernet capabilities?
And we have, you know, in, in case you didn't hear Mark's answer, it was like the passive doors are kind of dumb. They're just plumbing, right? So we, you can have circuit setters and valves, and you could have wireless controlled valves, and you could have the CDU interfacing the, oops, I went too far. The active doors, of course, have a, uh, you, you can see here in this picture, there's like a little control unit here that can be accessed touchscreen or could be accessed from some other, it could be wired into a, a BMS and accessed from somewhere else. What I will say too is that these bigger systems, when we've done these installations and designs, they do have, you know, sensors and valving that is all, it's always, I don't think we've done one that wasn't wireless or at least wired into the system so that you can control setters and valving for these bigger systems to make sure they're really operating at as efficient as possible. Yeah, if in case and you didn't hear that, so the comment was on the active door, as an example, uh, this gentleman uses one that he's estimating about 300 watts per door for controlling and fans power and controlling fan speed, all that good stuff. And I think that's, I don't know if that's consistent with what, I know that we've been doing a lot of work on, so especially at this level, these bigger levels, really ultra efficient fans, right? Like really looking at the, some of the newest fan technology out there for especially, for, but it's easier when they're larger, right? Like the bigger fans, much easier to get more efficient. When you're at this case, you can see in this design, of course, we re, we're using bigger fans. It's pretty consistent, I think, with what other people are doing, but it'd be nice to be able to get these even more efficient. We're using uh, like the DC truck fans. Yeah. They're pretty efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Really well. It's 180 Oh, that's loud. Yeah, it's pretty loud. Right. We're running out of time, but I'm happy to answer any other questions we have or hang out afterwards. Yep, one more. So the question was, how do you balance the doors and the systems uh, when they're passive? Mark? Maybe hold the mic a little closer to your yeah. mouth. So, we can hear you. so I, I, again, that's where, um, that's where the circuit setters and the control valves are going to come in, right? And we have customers that use manual circuit setters, right, which is, which is fine. You typically try to set them under your peak load, right? Don't set them while the thing is just sitting there idle, and then when it goes to peak, the, the, it burns up something. Um, but that's where customers are trying to use the active, uh, you know, like the Bolimo valves and things like that that you can control. The problem that we run into is the doors have a minimum GPM through them, right? If you don't put four to six gallons per minute through them, um, then you don't get the water distribution through the door itself. And I will just make as a little uh, side note here at the very end. So the we it is a closed system, right? And and that it recirculates the water, and so we have to typically use we use a, you know special water, right? That has got the as we all know has the special sauce that everybody likes to put in there to keep organic materials down and to fight off any other kinds of corrosion. So that is an important point. It, it is, it's copper piping for the most part. We do have some that are stainless steel piping, but it's typically copper piping. Okay, well, thanks everybody, really appreciate it. <laughs>